You still have your voice, I hope. I'm looking forward to your, uh, your comments. Uh, before we get to Dad, uh, we've got two more guests. Joe, are you prepared to make your brief comments? Joe has got a tough job because he's, uh, Joe is the number one child of the third generation. I'm proud to say my number one child and Jennifer's. And um, so he speaks for all. He speaks for all 33, I hope. And uh, if you guys didn't tell him what, what to say, then that's on you. Would you like the mic, Joe? Yeah. Come on up. Thanks, Dad. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Bradford Fitzmorris. I have uh, a couple of acknowledgments because there's a lot of people that won't have a chance to speak. Um, how many Bradfords are here tonight? Show of hands. I'm particularly proud of that. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm named for, well, for all of you, I suppose. Uh, and how many of my, my cousins are here today? Let's see hands. This uh, this is the legacy of the of the Fitzmorris name. This is these are these are all the people that uh, are going to carry on, and uh, I'm certainly proud to be uh, you know cousin of all of you. Some of you are so much younger than me that you've developed the habit of calling me Uncle Cousin Joe, <laughs> um, which I've learned to appreciate. Um, I uh, grew up in California, but I now live in uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, and there are two others from the Raleigh clan. Where, where are they? Walker and Carolyn. We'd love to see you sometime. Uh, I've, uh, the theme of, of what I'd like to say, uh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, my mother is here tonight, uh, Jennifer Fitzmorris. I'd like you to stand up, Mom, please. Sister, Miriam, is here. Please stand up, Miriam. Uh, everything, just about everything you see here, the, the flower arrangements, the, um, the placards on the tables, your name cards, um, everything that you see, that you see that you've, um, all, all the sort of just niceties of this, uh, of this event, um, <coughs> were really made possible um, by uh, by a number of people, but uh, these are uh, you know these are two of the most important women in my life, and uh, they had, they haven't really gotten much uh, recognition. Uh, Renee as well um, was uh, was um, you know in this was just very important to this, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for you as I've always been. But thank you very much for helping putting this together. Uh, it, this was not. Uh, Your insight into this type of thing is uh, just the value is immeasurable. Uh, so, enough of the acknowledgments. Uh, I have learned uh, just a few, a, a number of lessons uh, over uh, over the course of my life. I'm 31 years old now, and um, so that's you know 31 years of grandchildren, just 31 years of being grandparents, and uh, there's been a lot of lessons learned in that time, but uh, there are just a few that um, that have come to mind in, in recent months as I've thought about uh, what to say, and um, so I'll, I'll illustrate those and, and uh, you know, keep it pretty simple. Uh, there was, uh, I was um, sitting with Grandpa maybe 10 years ago now, and we were looking at old photos, and there was a photo of the two of us, I was um, you know, this big. I was I was a little kid. I was one, two, who knows? We, there, it was a it was a family wedding. I don't know whose wedding it was, but um, I was uh, you know very small. And Grandpa is, is holding me, and uh, he can't be more than fifty at the time. And uh, he's got um, this full head of just almost jet black hair, and. Uh, I, of course, have no really, uh, there's not been my experience, Grandpa has always had, you know, some gray, and, and uh, as you do, and I just thought it was kind of remarkable, and I actually thought that he looked rather handsome and impressive, and so I said to him, being 
sort of an idiot at the time. Uh, Grandpa, you look so good with that, you know, with that dark hair. Why don't you dye your hair? Uh, and uh, everyone here knows Grandpa well enough, knows Neil well enough to know what an absurd idea that is. And he just looked at me and he said, uh, why would I? You play the hand you're dealt. And uh, I didn't really know what that, too much what that meant other than, you know, just take what, what you're given and, and go from there. Uh, but as I've thought about it in years since, uh, you know, Grandpa has had a lot of very amazing experience that we've seen chronicled in, in photographs and, and in talks. And he um, he was pursuing pursuing a you know a medical degree and then and then a, a PhD in, in neurophysiology. Um, he was you know according to my dad just only had to write his thesis and he was going to be on his way. Um, as often happens, money dried up, grants, funding, that sort of thing, and um, he had a growing family to support, so he just walked away from it. I mean, I, I think with the intention of going back one day, but he, um, he nevertheless, he had, uh, you know, he had to do what he needed to do, so he turned away and um, started a career uh, as a, a pilot with American Airlines, and um, we all know him for that. Uh, Fantastic career of almost 30 years, um, and uh, I don't think I've ever had the conversation with him about what if, because it doesn't matter. Um, you you play the hand you're dealt. It's it's the best way to live life. Uh, and that uh, that brings me to an uh, anecdote he told me once about um, his days in the airlines. He's um, they're flying and uh, there's some bad weather, and uh, so he's. Order to you know, order to, to reroute and, and land somewhere else. So he turns to his co-pilot and says, "We need to. Uh, we, there's there's bad weather in Chicago, and uh, we need to uh, land in Madison." And uh, the co-pilot turns to him and says, uh, "Where's Madison?" <laughs> and he looks at him and says, "It's in Wisconsin." And the co-pilot turns and says, "Where's Wisconsin?" <laughs> the man in charge of getting you safely from A to B. <laughs> and, um, and that uh, makes me think about this, this theme, Grandpa the Renaissance Man. There's a quote that I love uh, by Abraham Lincoln. Maybe some of you have heard it. He said, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. Grandpa is a renaissance man. He knows engines, he knows architecture, he knows chemistry, flights, electronics, medicine, um, history, agriculture, religion. I mean, you could shout out a hundred more. Um, but he knows enough and even more to be valuable to the world. Um, and everything from putting food on the table for his children, and his grandchildren, down to entertaining a stranger or shortly 100 friends and family members at a party. And uh, I didn't know it until recently, but I have spent my 20s staying valuable through some of the worst economic times, uh, certainly the worst economic times I've ever seen in my life. Um, and it's kept me employed throughout, kept me uh, above water. And, now in a uh, successful career that I'm quite proud of. Um, and that is not an accident. And that, that point about entertaining folks at a party has been said quite a bit. Grandpa has taught me how valuable it is to just learn how to interact with as many people as possible. Wherever we've gone, you know, picking me up from school when we lived in LA, or you know, coming down to visit and we drive to a you know a, a taco shop, uh, going on some walk and just running into some strangers, Grandpa can strike up a conversation with anyone, and it's incredible. It's um, I mean, if you really try to do this, it's um, it's actually difficult. Um, I mean, it certainly is for me, and I've gotten a lot better at it. But uh, the better I get at it, the 
easier my life is and the more effective I find I can be. And um, it's, uh, it may come naturally to him because he just loves it um, or because he's just you know, simply that good at it. But uh, try it. Um, you'll be amazed, the better you get, just how much easier life becomes. And uh, I have my, uh, my grandfather and my dad uh, following him to thank for that because they're both masters at it. And, uh, you know, when I look forward to being just as good as either one of you. <laughs> and uh, that leads me to my last, uh, last pearl of wisdom lesson from, uh, from Grandpa. Christmas of uh, 2005, my family, my immediate family, we went, uh, took a trip to, uh, to England. Uh, we went to, uh, to Bath, um, we went to London, and uh, my grandparents met us out there for the, uh, the first part of the trip. They weren't there for London, right, but they were there for, for the, the Bath portion. And uh, a few of us went just out to a, a local pub. It was, it was me, it was my dad, it was grandpa, I think Mary was there, uh, maybe Ellen. At any rate, uh, we're, um, we're having beers, having some pints, and just talking about whatever came to mind. And then when the conversation came to the topic of women, and uh, I don't know how this came to be, but uh, Grandpa, we were talking about how men, men will often marry women that are a great deal younger than they are. And uh, you know, the, the reasons are you know, plenty and, and not really worth going into. But Grandpa made the comment that he could never really relate to that. Um, that you know, if there was this attractive waitress that came by and would strike up a conversation, no matter how compelling she may seem, she could never be as engaging and interesting and compelling as Nana. And he could never imagine um, the idea, you know, what, what a, you know, what a guy would be thinking, you know, marrying some, you know, hooking up with some woman, you know, so much younger than him, because, you know, that's that's really what life's about. That that engaging, the engagement, that that intellectual stimulation. Um, and uh, you know, I just thought, well, Grandpa loves Nana, and, and that's of course what he has to say. But in thinking about, you know, the, the course of their marriage and what I've observed and what I've heard, Grandpa finds. He finds Nana extraordinary. Um, I mean, amazing, just terrific. And that's such an obvious thought to me because I do too. And so do all of her children. And so do all of her grandchildren. Um, it's why we're all here. And um, so that's the, you know, the last lesson. Choose someone that you find extraordinary. bring a date tonight. Next time. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, that's about all I have to say. Um, and I'll just close by saying life gives us opportunities throughout to be grateful. Um, and uh, we all, we, we've, we've talked about a few of them, them tonight. And it occurs to me that the least of which is you know this this ability to participate in this wonderful tribute to uh, to our grandparents, um, but for me the greatest of which includes um, being the son of the man of Tom Fitzmaurice and the grandson of uh, Neil and Jenny Fitzmaurice. Um, I I can't I wouldn't want to be anyone else. Happy birthday.
I put together a few slides and uh, we'll just skip those. But the first five pictures that I have in Virginia were there from uh, college days and so forth. And I have two or three other things. But uh, no, I, I, it's too late. <laughs> so. Okay. You can uh, do a fan. My only notes are uh, rally the house, but Joe already did it. So let me ask you how many here are. I got this idea this morning actually. I don't really prepare things to say. And I've always had the knack in the old days of doing that, but I'm not going to go into those details. We've lost all our time. And so I was thinking about doctor, lawyer, merchant, thief. So how many doctors, if you want to admit it, do we have here? Do we have any? There's one, two, another one somewhere? Three, maybe four. Four? I'm the sort of doctor that doesn't do any good. I'm sorry? I'm the sort of doctor that doesn't do any good. <laughs> How many lawyers? One, two, three, two of my kids. They probably don't want to admit it. That's five. Merchants. I include people that run businesses. Many more than that. How many merchants do we have? One, two, three. Four, five, six, and you? Okay, doctor, lawyer, merchant, chiefs. Well, that would be Hal Leo. <laughs> Raise up your hand. He's a Navy super guy. Bob Small, he's another one. How about Leslie? Where are you? you you're certainly a, a chief. Doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief. So where do we go from that? Well, it gets kind of tough now. So I'll start at the other end. That's doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Well, I'm the thief. I'm the thief because a long time ago, I didn't have any scruples about stealing a girl from another guy. <laughs> Even if I didn't know him very well. And of course, the result of that is sitting in here getting all this remark. Beggar man, I guess I've used the equivalent of I beg to differ many, many times, so I guess that makes me a beggar man. And a poor man, I'm poor, I guess, because I see so many things left to be done. There's not enough hours in the day or the weeks or the months. And so I just guess I have to let those things go. And I'm a rich man because of what I see here. So that's my watchword for the night. Doctor, lawyer, merchant, thief. Rich man, poor man, bigger man, thief. Now as far as all these remarks, the simplest thing to do would be to uh, just say that they're all right. They're all correct. <laughs> Thank God they didn't tell the real ones. <laughs> the, uh, the poteen that John mentioned, I will say that he has it just about right. The only thing he kind of shortened up the story, we actually carried that stuff around for about a week and we were afraid to try it. And we did get a spoon out and pour it in and light it once and it did burn blue, I think. <laughs> And, still tasted terrible. <laughs> the tradition in Ireland is that the nuns, prior to 9-11, would smuggle a poteen out by putting it in a bottle and labeling it holy water so that when they would go through customs, it said holy water and nobody had the nerve to open it. And that's an Irish tradition. And the other thing about it is that when we let John left us and Celeste and we sat there and I really didn't know at that time, I think maybe I didn't know he was a policeman, but what was actually said was, I said to the hostess, the wife of the policeman, I said, you know, I kind of got a problem. 
And uh, she says, what's that? Well, she says, you know, I'm just really good friends. And that's the way it started. And all through high school, Bob and I were, um, took the same kind of courses. And I was kind of different. I don't know about Bob, but the truth is it was a different world. My parents never said anything to me about getting good grades, any of that stuff. I didn't even think about grade points. I ignored the whole thing, but I liked school. And Bob and I took every math course they had in the high school, and then I think we walked over to the junior college, which wasn't done in the 40s, and took the next course. What Bob and I used to do was at the end of each class, you'd have 10 minutes of your homework, and we'd sit in the back of the room and we would race to see who could get the homework done the first. And usually we could. So I've tried to tell some of these grandkids, uh, liking it helps, but applying yourself helps even more. So that's what I remember about Bob, among many, many other things. And. Um, Okay. The other thing Bob didn't tell you was when we were out there trying out cars, this was before we got married, we, <laughs> we would, were looking for a mutually owned sports car was what we were up to. In those days, a sports car was a big thing. It could beat any Oldsmobile or Buick or Ford or anything. They all fell apart after a few months. So we did, in fact, drive some guys, Jaguar. And we did, in fact, get stuck in first gear. But Bob didn't mention that in the side pocket of the, one, of the driver's door was a revolver. And we don't know why we didn't ask. And we just took the car back. And he said, well, it does that sometimes. So our next uh, episode was, in those days, was a very popular and rare sports car called the MG. And some of you older people remember what the MGs looked like, a British-made car. And a guy uh, gave us the car, and off we went, and down in the Pensacola area, swampy area with flat roads. And we both had our hand in seeing how fast we could take the corners and all that stuff. We took it back to the guy. And he says, you know, it's never been raced. And as we drove away, Bob says, it has now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that. Now, Mike made some comments, and I don't remember why, but I've always defined civilization differently than some people. And I say civilization is about learning not to make the mistakes of your parents and grandparents. If you can do that, then you become more and more civilized. And so I've always rejected this idea of, well, kids do it too. And, Everybody complained about their kids clear back into the ancient Greeks. It's all bogus. The fact is, what I expect all my grandkids to do is learn from my mistakes and try not to make them again. And finally, I don't remember who said this, but one of the sayings I've cooked up to placate lost souls is something like this. The face of God is forever hidden from the side of man. And what I mean by that is that no matter how much science we do, how much conflicts, how much resolve, you're never going to quite get there. So I don't believe we're ever allowed to really see how it works. And the other thing I said about Christianity, there's been a lot of talk about that. Of course, I've lived in an environment where I have lots of relationships with people of other religions, people with no religion, people with no morals, people with lots of morals, self-righteous people, all kinds of people. And so what I've said to some of these people is, I actually don't know if there's a God. I heard Father Kidney say the same thing. You have faith that there is. I don't know if Christ ever lived, if he arose from the dead or if it's just some legend, but we have faith that it is. So what I've said to people is, when you really stop and think about it, the religion is a pretty good way to live, and it really doesn't matter in one sense, at one level, all the details that we can't understand. So I'm living that way. I think it's a good way to live. 
And that allows me to respect people with different opinions and so forth. And some of these outliers, as we might call them as Catholics, uh, are pretty good friends of mine. Um, <clears throat> what? Ah, wrong one. We got to go backward. Find the first one in that sequence. That's Virginia in Rome. So, let's see, what else was I going to say to you? I actually had this idea of, since I didn't know what was going to happen here, I didn't even know about it, I got this idea that maybe I would try and tell people how I got where I got. Maybe that would be interesting to some people. And I actually came up, I thought about it a lot with a routine, and I was going to illustrate it and go on and on, but it was, it's kind of dark and so forth. But I'll tell you the what it amounts to is, John Roth said I was very curious, and I only came to this conclusion about three or four weeks ago. When I got wind of this thing, a funny thing happened to me. I never think about myself. I'm not into self-analysis. I don't much believe in it. I never have. I've never questioned my attitudes. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I switch directions. So I don't I've never had a lot of faith in this sort of self-help sort of thing. I have confidence in what I think. And like I said, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Then I do something different. So the question is, how did I get here? And I, I have finally decided, and by the way, this party has made me brood a lot about this because I'm not a person that really is analyzed and worried about why I screwed this up or why that worked or why it didn't work. And I've had a lot of screw-ups in my life. So I'm thinking and thinking, and I finally said there's really three things that have made me who I am. And the curiosity is a common denominator. One of them is a touchy subject. And I have to explain what I mean, and that's sex. Now, I'm not talking about grandchild-style sex. I'm talking about what does it mean to the culture? What does this, this force that makes us survive mean? How does it work? The other thing that became a fundamental question in my life was religion. And the third thing was science. And so right there, and I was going to give you some examples in every decade of my life, how they made me switch my ideas on these three subjects. And of course, at the end of the day, it all turns into politics, which I'm not going to talk about at all. So that's kind of a, <laughs> that's kind of a, a downer. But I am a person that all my life has been very, very uh, curious. And uh, I'm also have this problem of work on a project and sometime at the end, um, when the curiosity is satisfied, I sometimes don't quite finish and then I move on to something else. I think maybe that's a defect. So let me tell you what the jobs I've held in my life are. I started out as a Western Union Telegraph boy at 12 until they found out I was 12 and after about a year they they can be. Next job is a paper route. That lasted until my dad had to take the route for a week. That was the end of that. Next job, I worked for the county, I think. No, I made, I formed my own company. Muscatine House Numbering Company. I invented this business of painting the curb numbers on, went to the city council, I think it was 14, got permission of the city to paint on their curbs. And another friend of mine was in that wedding picture, and I sold house number painting all summer in Muscatine. I don't know if we're the first to do it, but we did it. Made a lot of money. My next job is working for the county with Bob. They'd hire high school kids, and we'd get out there and dig and learn how to spit and cuss and all that stuff, which we didn't know much about. Next job, I dug ditches for the gas company. After that, I started going to the Navy each summer. I spent several months working on heavy construction as a kid. In college, I was a houseboy at a sorority. A lot of stories there, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> then I got a job in the chemical engineering department running a reactor for a PhD student. 
then I'm in the Navy. I guess the next thing I did was I got to my first job as a chemical engineer. Sputnik went over in December of 19, what, 57? And that bugged me so much, I finally think, I've got to do something about this. So I started going to night school at UCLA Extension. Eventually, I said to my boss, I said, I'm going back to school. So I announced to my wife, with all our children, that I'm going to go back to graduate school because the extension thing didn't work for me, too much work. My next job was as a tech writer for one of the aerospace companies because they, I could work part-time. I did that for about a year. Then I quit, went, became a physics graduate student. First year I survived, but didn't do very well. And I said to my advisor, who turned out to be a very famous man at UCLA, how come you let me sign up for two courses that I didn't have the credentials for, had no experience in? He says, you're a big boy now. You're supposed to know that yourself. So that ended my physics <laughs> career. <laughs> However, I gamed the system, gamed the system, and I kept my registration as a physics graduate student, but I'm taking engineering courses. I took Russian and I took biology. So at the end of that year, I started assaulting the medical school here at UCLA. And uh, I guess you know what happened. They said, no, 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 no. And then about the uh, middle of the summer, they called up and said, you're in. And I had a 2.8 grade point in college. Uh, you can explain that somehow. So the only thing I ever got A's in as a chemical engineer were English and a couple of other things, psychology, which I thought was a joke. So now I'm in medical school. I was the hit of the faculty party the first day of class because I had my fifth child that day. And I didn't really tell anybody, but someone found out and the faculty wives, they, I can tell you, were assaulting me like bees on honey, wanting to know about this. And I said, it's true, I just had my fifth child, so I'm starting as a freshman. And being this person that doesn't really organize well and loses track of time and all, I spent a month or two finding a house, which I moved to, and going to classes when I could. And of course, you all know how that works out. It didn't do very well. So the dean says, well, you, and a couple other guys, equally inept, said, OK, you can go another semester, but there's no guarantee. So I did another semester. Did pretty well, but I didn't make it through the committee. And the guy that cast the vote to kick me out was the psychiatrist who gave, uh, taught me six classes in the semester. I never had the slightest bit of animosity for these people. I said I screwed up. It's not his fault. It turned out I started a little war on the faculty and uh, maybe the richest grant receiver in the school hired me for the summer and said, uh, he's the guy that told me what happened. Physiology department said, you're in. So I became a physiology graduate student, direction for PhD. Worked all summer for the master. The Navy called me up and off I go to the tour. A year later I come out, back into physiology. First time I ever got A's for a year or two in academics, supporting my family, flying in the reserves. So you get the idea. And uh, what happened then was I did a lot of good things, a lot of slow things, did a lot of surgeries. I was sort of the laboratory's go-to graduate student. Um, did a couple surgeries by myself so on and so forth, but as time went on, I kind of ran out of gas. The grants all stopped, so I went to work for the airline halfway through. And uh, the head of my department said, I'd really like to give you more grant money and some loans. And I said, I owe more than a professor's year salary. I can't borrow any more money, so I'm done. Hung on part-time for two or three more years. 
And then I got the letter from the physiology department that says you are dismissed in good standing. Very unique letter. If you can put together a program, we will welcome you back. But by that time, the Navy Reserve decided I should be a commanding officer of the squadron, which was getting to be a big deal in those days. My mother became very, very ill, so I decided I had to tell, help run her business. Of course, the rest is history. So I actually had command of three different Navy units. I ran four stores, lost a bundle of money, and that was kind of the way it went. So finished up my career as an airline pilot, honorable profession, never really had any interest in being one, but I think I did a good job at it. And so toward the end of the time when I retired, I said, I think I'm going to rebuild my house. I had a lot of opposition, but I said, this time I'm going to finish something. So I became a small letter architect. And like all architects, the house is livable, but it ain't finished. No architect ever does, so that's my claim to credentials. It's still not quite finished. You're all welcome to come and look. And so that, if that makes me a Renaissance man, I'm not really sure. Uh, it means I know a lot of stuff about a lot of things, but I'm not sure quite how that plays. The PhD, you know, they say is learning more and more about less and less until you know almost everything about practically nothing. <laughs> and I say what's happening to our schools is the reverse. They learn less and less, so pretty soon they know almost nothing about practically everything. So we have all these currents in our society. We're in a huge amount of flux. And all I like to do is keep on going. So that's, that's my history. Tell us about this picture here. What? Tell us about that picture there. <clears throat> I met this girl, and I really liked her. And the way I found that girl, some of you know the story, is uh, she was a transfer from another college. And my best friend, who was one of the people in that uh, wedding photograph, he's a retired chemistry professor in Wisconsin now, sent his regrets, by the way, he's still healthy. And so he and I got in my little Ford, and we decided to go around to all the dances for all the girls, all the uh, new students. So we went to one and the next and the next, and the Newman Club, which uh, those of you not Catholics know, is the, would know uh, is the Catholic Students Club. So the Newman Club is having their dance, mixers, that I'm, I'm looking at lots of words these days, and the mixer in the basement of the women's gym. So Dave Schrader and I pulled up in the car and we parked in the bushes illegally and then we crawled over to the basement window and we pulled the bushes back and we could see all the people. I said, Dave, there's a live one down there. And I sound like John Rolfe. <laughs> so down we went and of course the bell of the ball there I know how to do this by this time. I cut in on her, and you time it. And I say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and you're so-and-so, and I need your phone number because there's a dance next week. And she giggled and pushed me off like she did everybody. You know? And I get cut in on, right? The thing ends, and then you wait. It starts up again, some guy's dancing with her, and I wait until it's almost too late for someone else to cut in, I cut in again. I says, how about the phone number? So you're going to the dance the next Saturday. No, it's Wednesday. Same thing. And the third time, I said to her, you know, this is going to keep up until you give in. So she says, all right, give me her phone number. And I've actually said in public before, I took her to the dance. And at midnight, the tradition is you take the girl to the Campanile which is the big bell tower, and it rings, and you kiss the girl at midnight. So I didn't know how that was going to play out, <laughs> but uh, I did take her for a walk. It's getting midnight. I think the girls that I was seeing had to be in at 12:30. The bells rang, and I gave her a kiss. And uh, as I've said before, that kind of sealed the deal. <laughs> so we dated for two years in college with. 
knew all the up and downs and so forth. And she, we'd see the University of Nebraska playing, and she'd say, I know that guy, I went out with him. And then we were looking at Notre Dame, and she said, I know those guys. St. Teresa's Catholic Girls School, I don't know what that meant, I never figured it out. But I found out that Iowa U and Notre Dame were playing. And my home was about 30 miles from Iowa City. So I says, guess what? I'm going to take you to the Notre Dame game. And I said, we'll stay all night at my parents' house. And so for some reason, she accepted. So off we go, and we see a classic Notre Dame blowout, four backs in a row running the whole length of the field for a touchdown for Iowa. Huh. And off to my parents, my mother looks at her with suspicion. And of course, Jackie is somewhere else. So they put her to bed in Jackie's bed. And in the morning, before anybody's up, I get my camera and I sneak in the room and take her picture. And that's what that picture is. <laughs> Next one. Okay, 10 to 11, you guys. More pictures. Photos, 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 photos. Uh, this is an interesting picture. I think we were uh, probably, might be seniors, and I'm not sure, juniors, but with, this is final week, and we're doing the traditional studying for finals on a blanket with a stack of books. And I have a better picture that I couldn't find it. But that's what she's doing. We're out in some field somewhere with a blanket and a whole stack of books. In the big picture, you can see them all. And we're really studying. <laughs> Old Iowa tradition. <laughs> I shoot, uh, I scan too big a file, so they uh, take a long time to load. Now, this is a sign of my uh, reluctant girlfriend. See, she knew she couldn't change me, was mad about it. This is my desk, and I can't remember where it is, but she's invaded my room and uh, is disgusted with what my desk looked like. It looks exactly like that today. But that was in 1954. Different desk. I'm not going to put them through all this. And there is the young bride. Naturally, for her birthday, she's a farm girl, and all animals belong out under the hay fork, right? Not in the house. So for her first birthday, I bought her a German Shepherd puppy, a pure white one. And of course, all her Bradford relatives here are squirming with disgust. And there he is. Nice big dog and a nice pretty wife. I think we've been married about about a year then. And I think uh, one more. You probably miss it. That's it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And if you can make them go fast, go ahead. We'll get rid of them really quick, and then I'm done. That is uh, Virginia clowning around at John's baptism. That's a cigarette. That's a cigarette. Uh oh. I guess uh, that was with with John. Are you still here? Yeah, there he is. That's that's your baptism. That was our number seven. Okay, come on. If they're gonna go fast, otherwise it'll stop. And that's in Rome. Uh, just a couple weeks ago. So I think you all agree that the, the theft was uh, to my benefit. Uh, that's in Rome as well, some obscure temple, and there she's at the Fountain of Trevi. Some guy walks up to her and says, I don't know what he was up to, but he said to some young guy comes up to her and says, and I heard him, you're the prettiest woman here at the Fountain. Aww. This is my parents getting 
married. This is my father and mother to the right. Marriages were simple in those days. And this is my mom and dad. I just ran across this picture because they are also a big influence in my life besides sex, religion, and science. And um, there they are. They attended, I think, all the baptisms of all my children. That's uh, Tom and Jerry. Jerry and Tom. I found that picture I think five or six years after uh, it had never been developed, I found that one time. Anyway, onward. This is my sister, Jackie, here, and her children. And I put that there because she's also, for better or worse, a big influence in my life. Next. And there's Jackie and my wife in Rome on the Circus Maximus, one of the great places to be. I actually took Tom here with me when he showed up and said, we got to walk out there because when you stand here, you actually can feel what the civilization was like. I'm a great Roman fan, by the way. But that's where they are. This is me as a little kid. Aww. I'm in diapers. That's a chow that was Long Beach. And uh, that's what I look like. That was after they got the cactus spines out, I assume. <laughs> Same trip. Uh, this was my house at um, Independence, which is gone now. So you can click through this one, go down about four. And there's, there's some anecdotes about this area here. There's the church I was grew up in. Some anecdotes. Now, nah, stop here. These women all had babies. Her husbands were all in flight training. And they all had babies at the same time. And uh, this is Virginia. This is Bob Small. He's sitting there, his first wife, who passed away unexpectedly. This actually is a girl that I dated in college before I met that one. Very curious. Wind up at the same Naval Air Station going through training, and uh, they all have their babies. And we cannot remember who this is, unless Bob can remember. But uh, you talk about coordinated uh, menstrual cycles in an office, these people <laughs> can beat that any day. And this is uh, the men. Here's Bob. There's me. Here's Dr. Glass. Are you still here, Dr. Glass, or did you leave? Oh, there she is. Well, that's you. And this is, uh, I know him, he was at college, and I, that's the guy I don't remember. And this is uh, Dr. Glass as a small girl tormenting a wildlife <laughs> in the San Diego Zoo. And this is all of my children. This is my legacy. Slow, slow this down. All of them. Michael, Dr. Glass. Who says Carolyn, Julie, Tom, and Jerry? This is what it's all about. This is why I don't really care. Hello? I don't really care if I didn't succeed in this or that or other thing because it's all about these people out here. It's all about the next generation. So who knows? This is Carolyn again. Can you stop it there? There's a story about this, this slide. All the boys built this huge fort in the back. It was on a jungle gym. And it was quite a structure. So all the girls in the neighborhood were playing on that. Renee and I don't know if Julie was born yet. So Carolyn goes back in the backyard. This is when we live in the valley and wanted to play on the jungle gym. And they said, no, you're too young. So she goes back. And she goes on her tricycle and sits there, and I witnessed this. And then she goes and finds the boys, and she says, the girls are all playing in your fort. <laughs> so all Tom and Jerry and all the neighborhood boys went through them all out. So that's it. She's, well, she's a lawyer now. So. <laughs> and this is uh, Julie. Aww. And I think we got a couple of her. Keep going. 
we, we believed in letting the children be exposed to all the pathogens in the world. You know, that's no asthma in my family. This is John. He's a lawyer too, and this is David, who did the shoe dance up here. School teacher, one of the toughest jobs in the world. And that's David. And this is Julie again. I thought you'd like that one. Oh my God. <laughs> that's Julie. Oh my God. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, I, I could give you a million, but this is not the point. Ah, German Shepherd time. This is Roland, our new dog. We're, this is picking out, picking out the puppy time. The story here is Renee decided that at almost 80, we didn't have enough to do, so we should have a puppy. And there he is. And here is Allison. Where are you, Allison? She's up here helping to sing. This is Allison nurturing the little puppy. And here's a little puppy. Why am I locked in the kitchen? Which was, he thought was the bestest dog house in the world. Uh, the logo for this one is, don't worry mommy, I killed it. That, that was his dog bed. And uh, there he is when he came to me and said, what's you so excited about? <laughs> and uh, this is me teaching him how to take food without scarring me up. <laughs> this is one of the first lessons, as you can see. <laughs> this is a picture I stumbled across. This is me as a reservist about the time uh, I was starting my PhD program. And the interesting thing about this picture is really the next one. They used to paint up the reserves orange color so people could stay away from us. They could tell we were coming. And that was before we came. Now this is Bob Smalley. I found this picture. I've never seen it before. That's Bob. He came to visit me with probably when he went up to check the reserves. I think he's a lieutenant. He is. So that would put it probably in 61, 62. And now there's coming a slide or two that are kind of bummers. Oh, this is uh, Allison again <laughs> with her dog, and that's, he's not faking, he's, uh, he's awake, but he thinks that's just the greatest thing. And now I want you to stop it. Stop. I got some misgivings about this because I, this is kind of a downer what I'm going to show you, but in a way it kind of fits the theme, doesn't it, about what life is about. I don't want to get all funny about it, talk about uh, this and that. But this is at Pompeii, and this is a, what's left of a tomb. And I'm pretty sure this is a husband and wife. And of course, they were dead before the Vesuvius blew up. Uh, but walking around Pompeii, which has been one of my uh, quests for many years, is an amazing experience because, first of all, it's ten times bigger than I thought. And after a while, you say, well, gee, it's all the same. But what you see is this huge city with shop after shop and house after house and inner gardens and so forth, some of which they replanted. And so what I want to show you next, so wait a minute, is something you all know about, but for some reason, I think, I think it's worth, worth thinking about. What happened when the ash came down is there's different temperatures of ash. And the ash that came down in Pompeii uh, was hot, but it didn't re wasn't that hot and it didn't pack very well. And so, for example, in some of the ruins around Naples, the wood survived because it was hot and charred. So they actually could see the wood in the lintels of the doorways, but in this place, the wood all rotted away. So what happened is, is that this ash came down out of the nowhere in the thunder. Thousands of people died instantly. They didn't, they died in their tracks. People excavating all these ruins maybe 200 years ago or when they first found this thing, they would occasionally stick a pig in and it would be hollow. They finally figured out 
that that's where something had been that had decayed and gone. And so they poured plaster of Paris in to see what it was. So now I'm going to show you what, and most of you know this story. So go ahead, next slide. And this is what they found. This is a child. This is his mother, probably. We don't know. You can see his lips and nose and nostrils. Um, next slide. And this is another couple of people. This woman may be his mother. Don't know what he was doing. They were in sort of a vineyard, probably working, had the kids with them. And when you think about this, literally thousands and thousands of people died within seconds. We know a lot about this because Pliny the Younger survived and wrote about it in great detail. Pliny the Elder, as some of you know, didn't make it. And I'm not sure what the lesson is, but I do know that if you, one of the things we have to do is accept the realities of life. Put that back on. Go back, go back to the next one. And stop there. So this is Jackie, my wife, and me on the furthermost aft seat on the airplane, out of Rome, heading for New York. So I guess it's sort of the end of the trip. Uh, some of us are smiling. Some of us never smile. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I don't know whether this is an ending or beginning. That's up to somebody else. And one of my sayings is, we all have a clock inside, but we're not allowed to look at it. So that's the end of my philosophy.